Welcome to Science Update. This is a new Facebook Live broadcast where I look at the latest discoveries in science and what they mean for the Christian faith. This is designed to be a complementary broadcast, a sister broadcast, if you will, to Question of the Week, which is a broadcast where I take on your science faith questions. Uh, but what we're going to do in this broadcast is focus on new discoveries in science. So Question of the Week is not going away, but rather I'll complement the Question of the Week broadcast with this new broadcast science update. The goal is to make this interactive, so I'm looking for you to send me suggestions about uh, what kind of uh, science faith discoveries that you would be interested in me commenting on. So if you've got uh, science in the news articles that you think are interesting and you want to know my perspective, you want to know the implications for the Christian faith, or even if you're reading the scientific literature and you've stumbled across uh, upon a journal article that you think is interesting, send it my way and I'll consider it for this new broadcast, again, Science Update. Uh, this week's uh, topic comes from Brian Brock, who sent me a link to an article published in, a, or sorry, published on a website called Science Daily. And the, the title of the article, well, let me pull that out here, sorry, I should have had that ready, is ancient fossil microorganisms indicate that life in the universe is common. And so the question that we're going to take on today is this. Does the early appearance of life on Earth mean that the origin of life process from an evolutionary standpoint is easy to take place? And if so, does that mean that life must be abundant in the universe? Now, before I take on those questions and take on this topic and uh, unpack this discovery that uh, motivated these headlines, I'd like to ask you, as is customary, to check in, let us know who you are, where you're watching from. This is valuable information for us to have, and also it's a chance for me just to get to know you a little bit better. Also, I would like for you to react to the broadcast, use the like button, or if there are ways that you think we can improve the broadcast, please let me know, and I'm happy to take those suggestions into account. But the more interaction with the broadcast there is, the more likes, the more comments, the greater the visibility in the Facebook feed, and that helps us to get this message out. And then also, I want to know your perspective on this question. Uh, is the origin of life easy? Uh, and is life abundant in the universe because life appears very early in Earth's history? So, without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at this week's uh, science update topic. Now, uh, in broad picture terms, this discovery that we're going to talk about relates to a question. Is the origin of life explicable through evolutionary means, or is it necessary to evoke the work of a creator to account for the genesis of life, for the beginning of life, for the emergence of life uh, on earth? And uh, from a, an, an evolutionary perspective, uh, the idea would be that chemical evolution would be a process that would require uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years to take place, if not uh, up to a billion years to take place. This has been the traditional perspective uh, within the scientific community as they looked at the idea of chemical evolution. And uh, I want to read to you a quote uh, from Carl Sagan, published in 1966. And uh, this is the very early days of original life research. This was about a decade and a half after Miller did his famous Miller-Urey experiment. And as biochemists were beginning to get a sense of the complexity of life at a molecular level, the implications for Carl Sagan and other um, origin of life researchers was that the origin of life process it must have been protracted. This is what Sagan said. 
There is an elaborate apparatus involving messenger RNA, adapter RNA, ribosomes, and a diversity of specialized enzymes. We cannot imagine these complex and specific accessory molecules to have arisen spontaneously in the primitive environment. The apparatus for the transcription of the genetic code must itself have evolved slowly through billions of years of evolution. And so the idea here is this, that from an evolutionary perspective, in the initial days of original life research, the expectation was that this process must have been a protracted process that, again, was on the order of hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, uh, uh, up to a billion years, maybe even more than that. And so one way in which we can assess this, this question, does the original life have an explanation through chemical evolution, or do we, does it, do we need a creator's handiwork to explain where life comes from, can be found, or at least insight to these questions can be found by looking at when does life appear on Earth, what is the mode and the tempo for the appearance of life on Earth, and what are these very first life forms like. And this is where the, the headlines that we're going to talk about come into play, because uh, over the last couple of decades, researchers have been studying the fossil record and the geochemical record for some of the oldest rock formations on Earth. And from this, they've gained an understanding as to when life would have appeared on Earth and what these very first life forms would have looked like. And some of the very first work towards that end was published in 1993 in the journal Nature, I believe. It was either Nature or Science. But it was work published by a researcher from UCLA by the name of Bill Schaff. And Bill Schaff uh, reported on the discovery of microfossils, microscopic fossils of bacteria found in something called the apex chert, which is a uh, part of a rock formation in Western Australia that dates at about 3.45 billion years in age. At that time, these were the oldest fossils that have ever been discovered and they were indicating that life on Earth appeared very early, surprisingly early, much earlier than anybody would have imagined. And uh, Bill Schaff argued that based on the morphology of these microfossils, it looked as if they were photosynthetic bacteria, that they were similar to cyanobacteria. Uh, and he argued that this metabolic process, which is one of the most complex processes that we know of, actually appeared very early again in Earth's history. Following this discovery was the discovery of stromatolites, macroscopic fossils that are produced by the activity of microorganisms. And these, again, were recovered in the same rock formations. Uh, also, people discovered microfossils and, again, stromatolites in rock formations in um, South Africa that were slightly younger, about 3.2 billion years in age. Uh, since that time, people have discovered microtubules, which are structures formed by rock-eating bacteria uh, in these rock formations in Western Australia. There have also been dis the discovery of microbial mats, fossilized microbial mats, uh, which again are macroscopic structures produced by the activity of bacteria. And there's also geochemical signatures, carbon-12 enrichment, sulfur-32 enrichment, that again are, is suggesting biological activity was present on the early Earth. Uh, shortly thereafter, people discovered uh, geochemical signatures in rock formations in western Greenland, uh, the Isuo rock formation, that indicate that life was present even at 3.8 billion years ago. And not only was it limited to carbon-12 enrichment, uh, but also it was uranium-thorium fractionation, the distribution of iron isotopes in banded iron formations, uh, as, other instance, uh, as other evidence that suggested the early appearance of life on Earth at about 3.8 billion years in age. Uh, a few months ago, people discovered stromatolites in a newly exposed outcropping of rocks in the Asua Formation, thanks to global warming and the melting of 
part of the ice sheets in Greenland, these outcroppings of rocks were exposed for the first time, and lo and behold, researchers discovered stromatolites in these formations. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, researchers have claimed that there is evidence for life on Earth that goes back to be between 4.2 and 4.4 billion years in age. This remarkable claim comes from analysis of zircons. Zircons are very hard minerals that are found in uh, the rock formations in Western Australia, but they date to 4.2 to 4.4 billion years in age. And in these uh, formations are graphite inclusions that show carbon-12 enrichment, suggesting that life was present on Earth as early as 4.2 to 4.4 billion years in age. And then just a few months ago, researchers also reported on uh, the discovery of graphite that was enriched in carbon-12 in um, the Labrador formations in Canada that again, indicate that life was present very early in Earth's history, even earlier than 3.8 billion years in age. And so this is all very exciting uh, discoveries that were kicked off in 1993 by Bill Schaff's discovery. Now, it's important to note that while the, the consensus seems to be that life appeared very early in Earth's history, we have a, a powerful weight of evidence from a number of different rock formations, a number of different independent uh, biosignatures for life, each of these discoveries is controversial to some degree because researchers claim that these features very well may be explained through abiotic processes. Could the stromatolites be pseudofossils produced by some kind of abiotic mechanism where they're masquerading as stromatolites or microbial mats. Uh, people challenged Bill Schaff's microfossils, Martin Brazier being one of them, by saying that these again were pseudofossils that were abiotically produced graphite that just uh, happened to look similar to the fossil traces of uh, things like cyanobacteria. And other people have argued that some of the geochemical signatures could be explained again uh, through abiotic uh, uh, reactions that would have taken place on the early Earth. So there's controversy surrounding these discoveries, but the, 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 this controversy is slowly abating where more and more researchers are conceding that life doesn't appear, looks as if it appears very early in Earth's history. Now, uh, I remember uh, in 2002, uh, attending an Origin of Life conference where Martin Brazier challenged the, the bioauthenticity of Bill Schaff's uh, microfossils. And it was really pretty heated at the Origin of Life conference when Brazier presented his paper and then the conference organizers gave a chance for Bill Schaff to offer a rebuttal to Martin Brazier's, uh, to Martin Brazier's assertions. And since that time, Bill Schaff has been trying to provide additional evidence for the bioauthenticity of these microfossils uh, in the apex charts. And a few years ago, he, with other collaborators, explored the use of Fourier transform Raman microspectroscopy, where uh, these researchers could record Raman spectra of these uh, microfossils. And from that, they could determine that they appeared to be made up of kerogen that was undergoing a process of graphitization, which would be consistent with these fossils being a, a, of a biological origin. Uh, but just um, recently, Bill Schaff and collaborators from the University of Wisconsin published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where they provide, I think, incredibly compelling evidence that these microfossils are bioauthentic and they employed a technique called secondary ion mass spectrometry and methodology designed specifically to record um, SIM spectra, SIM mass spectra of, um, of these, uh, of, of microfossils. And what they're able to do through these uh, analyses is get the carbon-12 to carbon-13 distribution of the, of the carbon-associated with the, the microfossil traces. 
And what they did in their study is they examined 11, uh, 11 fossils uh, that represented five taxa. Uh, Bill Schaff argues that if you look at the shape of the individual cells in the microfossils, uh, the length of the chains, uh, the size of the, of the microfossils, uh, the, the end fossils uh, that are part of the microfossil chains, you, or sorry the, the, sorry, the end structures of these microfossil chains, you can actually categorize them into different taxa. And so of the 11 samples they looked at, they represented five different taxa that are believed to be five different types of microorganisms. And they noted that the carbon-12 enrichment uh, in these fossils varied from taxa to taxa, but indicated that that must be the product of biological activity. And the carbon-12 enrichment is, uh, the degree of that enrichment is characteristic of different metabolic processes. And so they argue, it looks as if you have organisms that were engaged in photosynthesis, probably anoxygenic photosynthesis, which would be photosynthesis in an environment where oxygen is absent. Also, it looks as if there were archaea that were part of these fossil assemblages that um, were engaged in methanogenesis and methanotrophism. Uh, and in, in addition to that, they argue that there's also sulfur-32 enriched sulfides that are in these formations that suggest certain types of sulfur metabolism like sulfate reduction. And so they argue that not only does this now demonstrate that these fossils are bioauthentic, but it is more evidence that life appeared very early in Earth's history, but that this very early life was metabolically diverse. So not only do we see life appearing early in Earth's history, it appears to have attained a wide range of metabolic diversity very quickly. Uh, and in fact, this insight from Bill Schaff is essentially not surprising because other studies have also implied a, an extensive uh, diversity of microorganisms on the early Earth. The existence of stromatolite fossils, for example, suggests, again, this high degree of microbial diversity because micro, or sorry, because stromatolites are complex microbial communities that would host a wide range of different types of bacteria and archaea. So it looks as if what we're seeing here, when we put all of this data together, is that life appears very early in Earth's history. It is microbial life, bacteria, and archaea. But this, this life is metabolically complex and metabolically diverse. And this, I would argue, is essentially a, 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 a discovery that represents a failed prediction for the evolutionary paradigm. Because again, the expectation was that life should appear uh, on Earth over a protracted period of time, not early, and it should not attain complexity and diversity that quickly, but rather it should be a long protracted process. And this becomes really apparent, that is, that th these, this discovery of early life on Earth as a, uh, as a failed prediction of the evolutionary paradigm becomes very apparent when we set this discovery in the context of what was happening on the environment of the early Earth. The Earth forms, oh, roughly 4.5 billion years ago. And at the time of its formation, the Earth would have been a molten planet. Uh, the, the gravitational energy being re released as pla planetesimals would have accreted to form the early Earth would have rendered the Earth in a molten state. There would have been higher levels of radioactive isotopes on the early Earth that, that decay would have liberated heat that would have also contributed to the molten state of the Earth. And the Earth was also experiencing impact events that again would have rendered the Earth into a molten state. Oceans would not have been present on the surface of the Earth uh, early in its history. Now the traditional view was that this was the state of the Earth from the time of its formation until roughly about 3.8 billion years ago where oceans became permanent features as on the Earth, as the crust of the Earth cooled down to form a hard material. Uh, but that uh, traditional view is being challenged primarily by 
uh, the discovery of these zircons that date between 4.2 and 4.4 billion years ago. The oxygen isotope distribution in these zircons suggests that they were formed under aqueous conditions, meaning there must have been bodies of water on the Earth prior to 3.8 billion years ago, which means there must have been crust on the Earth uh, uh, earlier than we thought, uh, plus the signatures that we're seeing for life prior to 3.8 billion years again suggest there must have been some kind of aqueous environment um, on the early Earth. It may not be that the Earth was covered with oceans, but there were bodies of water present on the early Earth, at least if you take the zircon data uh, seriously. Uh, and then what we see at 3.8 billion years ago is something called the light heavy bombardment. This is an event where uh, some kind of gravitational perturbation in the solar system causes comets and asteroids to pummel the inner solar system planets, including the Earth. Uh, traditionally, people thought that this light heavy bombardment would have been a sterilization event, destroying life on the surface and the subsurface of the planet. It would have been a frustration event for the origin of life. In effect, setting the clock at t equals zero, though there are now people who argue that maybe the light heavy bombardment was not a sterilization event, or if it was, the sterilization would have been limited to the surface of the Earth. So there's a lot of questions that are in play, but what is clear is that right after the light heavy bombardment, we see evidence, uh, again, for life appearing on the early Earth, a microbial life that is metabolically complex and metabolically diverse. It may be that life appeared even earlier on Earth, between 4.2 uh, and 4.4 billion years ago. E in either scenario, there's not a lot of time for life to originate. You really have a very truncated window for the origin of life. And it may be that life would have had to have originated on multiple instances on the Earth, both prior and subsequent to the late heavy bombardment. But either way, there's not a whole lot of time for the original life to take place. It looks like it was a rapid process where, again, metabolically, metabolic complexity and diversity were achieved very, very quickly. Now, this is why Bill Schaff argues in uh, this Science Daily article that maybe life must be abundant throughout the universe. Because the argument goes something like this. Well, if life appears on Earth that early and that this kind of biochemical and metabolic diversity can be attained that quickly, it means that the origin and the early evolution of life must be a really easy process. And if it's an easy process, life must be abundant uh, throughout the universe. That's the reasoning that we see here. But I would actually argue that this constitutes circular reasoning. Why? Because we don't have independent evidence that suggests that chemical evolution would be a rapid process. We simply don't have that data. What we see researchers doing is this. They're saying life appeared early and it appeared quickly on the early Earth when the conditions of the Earth were suitable for life. Therefore, it must be a rapid process. It must be an easy process. That's circular reasoning. Uh, because what we really need is an independent body of data that says the kinetics for the original life process would be rapid enough to fit with what we see in the geochemical and the fossil records. And we simply don't have any data of that sort that exists. Now, the, the closest that we have to that kind of data, to my knowledge at least, is a study done in the mid-1990s by... Um, uh, Antonio Lascano and Stanley Miller, who were trying to see if they could explain the origin of life in a window of time uh, of uh, around 10 million years. And what they did is they identified six steps in the origin of life process, uh, the formation of prebiotic materials, the assembly of the very first self-replicators, the emergence of the RNA world, the transition from the RNA world to the DNA protein world, the emergence of starter proteins, and the emergence of gene duplication and divergence. They argue that these are six major steps in, in, the, in the origin of life uh, uh, process, 
and that if we know the rates for each of these individual steps, we can sum them up and see if these rates can be accommodated in about a 10 million year window of time. But as Lascano and Miller pointed out in their paper, uh, we, we only know the rates for the first and the sixth step. We don't know the rates for steps two, three, four, and five. But in this paper, they said, well, these steps must be rapid, even though we don't have any kind of kinetic data for them, they must be rapid because life originated so rapidly on the early Earth. Again, circular reasoning is being employed. And so to me, the bottom line is this, that you cannot say that the early uh, uh, appearance of life on Earth and the rapidity in which uh, diversity is attained can be explained through m evolutionary mechanisms. We simply can't say that. We don't have any data to say that whatsoever. In fact, we actually have data to the opposite end. Work in chemical evolution has basically le led to the recognition, even by original life researchers themselves, that the origin of life problem appears to be intractable. We don't understand how life originates. The more that we study the origin of life, the more uh, problematic a chemical evolutionary scenario appears to be. And so we, we can't really say that there is a mechanism that we've identified that can account for the rapid early appearance of life on Earth and the rapidity in which, again, metabolic diversity is attained. Which now leads us again to the conclusion that this key prediction of the evolutionary paradigm formulated in the very early stages of uh, original life research has been falsified. Now, in addition to that, we could, we could, um, sorry, lost my train of thought, uh, but what this data does seem to indicate to us is that life looks like it is the handiwork of a creator. Now, why would I say that? Because we see life appearing rapidly, in a sense, in a geochemical instant on the early earth, or sorry, a geological instant on, on instance on an early earth. It is complex. It is diverse very quickly. That to me is a signature for the work of a creator. If a creator spoke life into existence, what would it look like? It would look like it appeared suddenly again and would appear complex in its initial state. But add to that the fact that when we look at biochemical systems, they have the appearance of design and we can you look, look at the nature of biochemical systems and reinvigorate the watchmaker argument for God's existence developed by William Paley. So we can actually formalize that appearance of design into an argument for God's role in bringing life into existence. There's work in uh, synthetic biology that shows that intelligent agency is indispensable when we try to create protocells from uh, chemical constituents. And so when we put all of this together, we see that life appears early in Earth's history, it appears um, rapidly, that it is com metabolically complex at the onset, that metabolic diversity is attained very quickly on the early, on the early Earth. Uh, those are, again, signatures for a creator's involvement, and that life as it appears on Earth has the appearance of design, and that we know empirically what it takes uh, to make protocells, and that is in the intelligent agency exerting its control and influence over molecules to get them to, to assemble into these super systems that are beginning to resemble uh, uh, cellular entities. Uh, and, and then again, recognizing that the origin of life through chemical evolution at this point in time has no explanation. When we put it all together, I think we can conclude that chemical evolution cannot explain the origin of life, that the origin of life must involve the handiwork of a creator. In fact, this was a, a conclusion I arrived at over 30 years ago when I was a graduate student. Uh, this, this, this type of reasoning is what convinced me that there had to be a creator. And of course, if we come to that conclusion that there is a creator, then the question is, who is that creator and how do we relate to that creator? And for me, I think the answer to those questions is found in the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ. So uh, the bottom line is this, 
that um, when it comes to the origin of life question, this is a place in the life sciences where we have the most compelling reasons to think that a creator must be responsible for bringing life into existence. And this is where we see uh, unequivocally the greatest problems and the most clearly seen problems uh, for the evolutionary paradigm. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Uh, I would invite you again to check in, let us know who you are, where you're watching from, uh, react to the broadcast with the like button, offer your comments on how we could improve this program. This is the inaugural program uh, for science update. Uh, so stay, stay tuned as we move into 2018. Uh, we'll be broadcasting more uh, uh, episodes of Science Update along with episodes of Question of the Week. Question of the Week is not going away. Uh, so uh, both of these Facebook Live sessions will be, uh, again, in play in 2018. But let us know uh, what you think of Science Update or what we can do to improve it. And then um, finally, if you want to offer your perspective on uh, this discovery and the question of the origin of life, I would love to hear what you have to say. I'm going to go ahead and bring things to a close, and I just am going to uh, remind you uh, that the more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. God bless you. Uh, until next time, I'm Fuzz Rana for Reasons to Believe. This was Science Update.